In, in the next part of this morning's event, um, which I've already suggested should be characterized by brevity of uh, comments from all of us, might it be sensible to break it into two parts? The first part can be very short, maybe not, non-existent. If you've got any questions about facts or about procedure, perhaps you could ask the commissioners now, and then we'll have an underst a better understood basis. There may be no such questions, but to begin with, can we just have questions of fact for clarification? Then, in light of what uh, Michael's already said, it would probably be sensible to have a period dealing with remedy, um, whether by comment or by question. And remedy, not just at the high and international level, but especially since we have so many people here from South Korea who've been active and are closer to the territory than the rest of us are, to know what the individuals can do, including the individuals who will view the video of today's events and whose help can be required. So I don't know if that's a, a, a logical way to proceed. So first, no need for there to be any questions, but preface any question by saying who you are. Any questions of fact on what was found or about procedure to the commissioners? Obviously a very, yes. James. Hello, my name is James from Gresham College. I had a question about the guards who we saw being interviewed. I was wondering about the possible backlash against um, the guards who are operating in the camp, be it legal uh, issues or backlash from the public, vigilante style stuff. Is the question directed at, do the guards who have given um, their statements on the film thereby expose themselves to the possibility of action against themselves by revealing that they have been engaged in, uh, in uh, the um, actions that they describe? Is that your concern? Yes. Yes. The mandate of the Commission required us uh, first do no harm and therefore we had to observe a principle that uh, we would not expose uh, people to um, any possibility of retaliation by North Korea and also that they would be advised of the possibility of self-incrimination in relation to any subsequent uh, proceedings. Um, uh, of course, the film that we saw was not a film produced by the Commission of Inquiry. And I would have assumed that Human Rights Watch is a most careful and attentive uh, organisation, uh, respectful of uh, victims and their rights and uh, potential risks, would have gone through a procedure with a protocol similar to our own. Uh, I can't answer for them, but I can answer for the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, our Secretariat was most mindful of uh, the uh, risks uh, and uh, the, the witnesses were warned and were given due caution and as I said earlier, some of them who were willing to give testimony were uh, in public were told that they should not do so but should give their testimony to us in confidence. Most witnesses gave their testimony to us only in confidence and not in a public way. But we did have evidence from some guards uh, and they are people who have relinquished uh, their contact with North Korea. They are people who um, felt an obligation to uh, tell what is happening um, most or certainly many of the prisoners are killed or die and as they described uh, and as much, with, much evidence that we received described, uh, a constant task of other prisoners is to dispose of bodies. Uh, the, there is nothing so close to the Nazi concentration camps in my knowledge 
as the descriptions of the necessity constantly to be churning through the disposal of bodies. And therefore, if the Commission uh, or Human Rights Watch and other NGOs need to get testimony, uh, having cautioned witnesses, such witnesses may nonetheless believe that it is their duty to express what happened. They were not the organisers. Uh, they are not responsible for the organisation of the political prison camps and other prison camps, but they were part of the service that so offended them ultimately that they fled. And I would think in the proper exercise of a prosecutorial discretion that a prosecutor who saw uh, that the type of testimony which we've seen today and uh, realised that it was given in, with a full heart and for the purpose of alerting the international community and an agency which it's set up to investigate um, the great wrongs that are done would take the view that whatever particular role a minor functionary took in the uh, cruelty that was described, that that uh, would not be a source of a prosecution because in the balance of what is an appropriate response by the prosecutor, that becomes part of the evidence and it's part of the evidence to alert the world of what happened and of the necessity to respond effectively. Thank you. I um, don't know whether Brad, Jeffrey... Can you, can you just confirm what the position was for the security of the people on the film? Uh, Cameron, uh, we, well, I th we and can maybe you can say, because you have, you've been very you, close yes. to this. Certainly we result. can stay here. I think they can focus the camera on us. Brad? Sure. I think it's a good question. Um, we obtained informed consent, and that often is confidential because it's confidential information. Um, but we did have a conversation with Anyone who had any concerns, first of all, to do it anonymously. You saw some of the testimony was camouflaged and masked. Uh, and in some cases, our um, suggestions that there were risks meant that people decided not to um, come forward. A lot of people have come forward to us with information about North Korea. And when we tell them what the risks are, and also we tell them what the limited possible benefits would be, because a lot of people think if they tell their story, things will change. And it's very important for us to tell them not that simple, um, that a lot of people then withdrew Thank you. A any other questions on facts, uh, either of facts in North Korea or facts about how the Commission did its work? Yes. Uh, Honourable Michael uh, Corey, I'd like to question. There are, according to the SUA report, there are first hand Witness, 80, 80 first hand witnesses. Yes. As a first hand. Then among them, do they, uh, are there any witnesses? Uh, it, is not it is not reliable. I cannot, uh, I cannot trust, believe your witness. Is there something wrong? Horror of the 80. The I think they the need the microphone. So, yes, well, well, well. 200 uh, not opened. There are so many witnesses. Among them, uh, it is unbelievable. So, you do not select those witnesses in this report. Yes. Who are whole of them was believable. Well, uh, it's true. We had 84 witnesses who gave testimony in public hearings. There were more than 200 witnesses seen in all, and therefore the majority did not give testimony in public hearings, but were seen privately. And uh, the commissioners saw some of the private uh, testimony and had full accounts of the others. Uh, and uh, some of that was extremely powerful, and some of that testimony was from very high former officials of North Korea. Uh, but uh, the testimony that was given was always preceded by a very careful process of, of warning and advice 
uh, so that the witnesses would themselves be aware of risks, uh, the possibility of risks would be explored. We would get notes of particular risks that we were to avoid, uh, questions we should not ask that might expose or the identity of a family member in North Korea, uh, uh, issues that should be avoided to uh, protect innocent people. And, uh, and uh, some of the witnesses adopted pseudonyms which were given to them, and some of them uh, adopted disguises of various kinds. So all of this is fairly regular uh, procedure, and it was very careful, but it was required by our mandate, which said, first do no harm, and that was the rule we observed. Hey, is there really a song which is excluded from uh, yes, well, there were certainly some strong witnesses whom, whom we saw, some of whose testimony is referred to in the report, who were received confidentially, but were believed. In your last question, there was a, a, a hint of a question. Did I think that of the 84 witnesses, there were some who were unreliable? The answer to that would be, I thought that in the case of a small number, not many, uh, they perhaps occasionally um, exaggerated a bit. Uh, and that is not unusual for people uh, who have had great sufferings and in many cases a long while ago. Uh, and sometimes, of course, people in a court or tribunal or inquiry context get caught up in, in the um, emotion of the event. But this is definitely a very small number. Uh, many members of the media, and certainly North Korea, uh, seem to think that it is impossible for people who have come forward to be truthful witnesses. But the answer to that uh, suggestion is in this case, you can go and have a look yourself. It's online, it's available. The commissioners formed the view that overwhelmingly the witnesses were reliable or we didn't refer to their testimony. But we thought they were reliable in part because the impression that they made of truth telling, in part because of their willingness on many occasions to make concessions which they wouldn't make if they were just propaganda agents, in part because they tended to corroborate each other by giving testimony on things, although they didn't know each other and sometimes gave evidence in different cities, uh, they gave evidence which was consistent and compatible with what others had said on the same general subject matter, and in part because we had uh, evidence um, such as satellite imagery concerning prison camps uh, where Amnesty International was of great help to us and the research of David Hawke. Um, and that also corroborated uh, the testimony that they gave and in part because the DPRK's own statistical and other evidence uh, and the work of United Nations agencies on the spot as for example the World Food Program uh, gave uh, reliable uh, testimony or gave reliable evidence that was available to us and incorporated in our record that uh, gave uh, support for what we were told by the witnesses. So I am not concerned at all in the suggestion that they're unreliable because they're hostile or because it's a long time since they've been in North Korea. These were up-to-date, relevant and reliable witnesses overwhelmingly and I say that not only on my own behalf, but for the two other commissioners. Yes, and Sonia, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No. Any other questions on facts before we turn to remedies? And I have one bridging question arising from one of Michael's uh, observations on which it might be helpful to have a contribution from one or two of the people on the in the audience, why has there been amongst 
the North Koreans living in South Korea, no um, government in exile or something similar. Now, I, I'm not sure if Mrs. Kwon, known to us as E.K., would, would want to contribute to that, or possibly in Suk Ha at the end, but I'm sure that on this interesting issue, it would inform the rest of the non-Korean audience to know if you have a view on that. or anybody else from Korea. Im Suk Ha, I think, has her hand up at the back. Yeah, Im Suk Ha. Um, as yesterday and today, Michael Kirby... A little louder, please. Okay. Uh, the reason why, even though there's 26,000 of defectors are in Korea, in South Korea, but the, why they do not make any like government exile or their own like group or um, to to work for their uh, like political groups is the reason is we have to consider the very uh, ideological conflict in South Korea. Um, I think many of you know that the Korean War is very very. Uh, tragedy or because uh, each uh, family members can uh, turn their arms against their family so it was a big tragedy in Korea but the the main reason of Korean war is ideological conflict so still uh, Korean many of old generation and my father's generation they are worrying about uh, uh, North Korean group. So if defectors are going to make their own group and they uh, brought out their political uh, point of view, maybe that generation will very, very worrying about those groups. And also in our uh, law system, there's a, uh, we still have a national security law and it, uh, it punishes when, when South Korean talk to uh, North Korea and if we make any contact to North Korea, North Korean. So you have to understand in Korean Peninsula, we still have a very, very strict ideology conflict. So that's why uh, people are not allowed any government exile of North Korea. Also in our like Constitution Article 3, uh, it says the territory of Republic of Korea sh uh, should consist of the Korean Peninsula and the adjacent island. So it says, uh, so under this constitution, if the North Korea make a government exile, it, it, people think that is a kind of hostile uh, group because the South Korean constitutional law said uh, we include our territory to, un, uh, to the North Korea. So we, South Korea think that government and many uh, old generations think that North, we are still in the armistice situation. So um, if, so when the North Korea make uh, their own community or government exile, it means that they build their own government in South Korea. So. Can, can I just seek clarification of your first point? Are you saying that if North Koreans sought to form a coherent or cohesive body, this would um, lead to adverse reaction from the South Koreans because they'd see that as in some way hostile historically? Uh, yes. Uh, if I haven't got it right, please correct me. got it only to right. Yes. Okay, well, if I've got it right, and I th thank you very much. Mr. Kwon, I think, would like to have a word as well. Uh, hi, um, my name is E.K. Uh, from Iceland Secretariat and uh, Open Radio for North Korea. Uh, regarding the exile government, um, uh, after, since the Korean War and uh, also 70s and going through 70s difficulties and 80s democratization period. In South Korea, we 
the, the way of unification, the only way of unification on the Korean Peninsula uh, was absorption uh, to, uh, to observe North Korean soil into South Korea. And also in North Korea, the uh, education, uh, obviously propaganda by the North Korean government was also uh, unification. The, the way to make the uh, one country on the peninsula was only unification. So unification education in both sides were quite strong. So even among defectors from North Korea, they also uh, only think the uh, uh, unification. And in North Korea, of course, the unification way is different from ours. Uh, theirs is occupying the south uh, soil uh, in in and to their side. Um, therefore, uh, we don't say, we don't think basically uh, an exile government or um, exile government to prepare the future unified country. But the only way we think is only unification uh, in a different, two different ways. So among defector, defectors generally think uh, the exile, we, we don't expect any exile government, but only South Korean government can make the uh, unify one uh, Korea on the Korea, Korean Peninsula. So defectors also also think so. The, uh, as I explained yesterday in The Hague, uh, Mr. the late Hwang jang um who used to be the uh, Mm, the secretary, uh, responsible secretary of the international affairs in the uh, Central Committee of the Workers' Party of North Korea. Uh, he defected into North Korea and the highest official, former highest official among the defectors in South Korea. And uh, three years ago he passed away, but uh, he, when he, uh, yeah, he, whenever we met him, he always said, we don't need any exile government because the South Korean government and South Korea is the uh, the the only government who can unify the whole uh, both Korean uh, governments. So the way of thinking to change or reform the North Korea and uh, the subject uh, would be the South Korean people and South Korean government, including defectors. Uh, it is general basic uh, thoughts among defectors and South Korean people. Thank you very much. Let's um, a contribution from behind you. Yes, and say who you are, please. Sir. Well, my name is Rajiv Narayan. I used to work for Amnesty International, uh, covering North Korea. Um, uh, but the other big reason was, was also pointed out in the film um, is also, of course, a lot of the twenty-six thousand who come, uh, of course, are worried about guilt by association. They're afraid if they come up, up openly, they have relatives. Uh, in uh, North Korea who could fall into trouble. Uh, and it, there are different strategies. For example, the prison guard, Ang Myung Chol, for example, actually uses publicity, saying that this publicity and spotlight helps him and his family to stay safe. But there are many others who believe the other way around, that they need to be anonymous, that even you know, their voices need to be uh, hidden because they, they can be tracked down, their relatives can be tracked down. The other part is also uh, a point which is raised in the report as well. The issue of uh, neighborhood, neighborhood watches and places like that. Uh, North Koreans always consider, I mean, they, many of them still would like to go back to North Korea uh, and, you know, if once the situation is far better. And so it's not surprising that many of them did believe in Kim Il-sung, uh, you know, charismatic leader. Kim Jong-il was a very different set. Of course, we also have the food crisis. Uh, which didn't help. Many of these people initially left North Korea in search of food. And uh, so you do have many of them coming to South Korea in search of uh, uh, employment. Many of them do send money back to North Korea too. Uh, all these, of course, as Ms. Uh, was saying, uh, do fall kind of gray area of national security law in South Korea. Today, actually, some North Koreans are facing, are, are detained in South Korea on charges of national security law for having either gone to North Korea without permission or having been in contact with these governments or in charges of being, of being spies. So you do have that issue. The third part is also there's no civil society in North Korea. So North Koreans have to come to South Korea, you know, first settle down 
and very few are able to then uh, have the luxury, so to say, of forming civil society groups. There are civil society groups, but more to help North Koreans themselves, to settle simple issues, how to get a driving license, how to get their children to accommodate to schools, how to get the health facilities in South Korea, because South Korea is a different country to North Korea, even though they speak the same language. And last but not least, many of the North Koreans, I think a majority of North Koreans, who come to South Korea are women. So that's another aspect which needs to be considered too, in respect, because many of them then try to settle down, rather than try to get out and form civil society organizations. I think it's the next generation which will start, we'll have to see how they start forming this uh, organization. Thank you very much. Staying with remedies and planning that we will allow Sonia and Michael closing remarks of perhaps about five minutes each or longer, but at least that, and hoping to draw as many contributions from the hall. Can I make one observation as we look at remedies, um, which has been the subject of the standard, the, the normal Gresham lectures in this very room over the last uh, 18 months, where we've looked at several um, different conflicts and their resolution or the means of their resolution. The tension between justice and some peaceful purpose, resolution of a conflict, is not one that it's easy always to say, to answer by saying justice must trump peace or the other way round. But it seems to me that that simply doesn't apply in the North Korean conflict. There is no good reason, none, that I can see why what's happening there should not be the subject of the best judicial process that the world can provide. And for that, the Commission of Inquiry's report is a first and critical step. And the question then is, what comes next? If there is to be a referral to the ICC, that will be uh, a process, successful or not in delivery of punishment or retribution or whatever else we can't forecast. One of the questions is, what happens if, sadly, that doesn't happen? What other remedies are there? And so, who else would like, I think, to contribute on, um, on the question of remedy? Ben. Thank you very much. Ben Rogers from Christian Solidarity Worldwide. I'm just going to ask two very brief questions, the first of which you've just asked, uh, Jeffrey, um, and so I would very much welcome Justice Kirby's and, and uh, Sonia's uh, comments on alternatives to uh, the ICC uh, should a referral fail, although I very much agree with Justice Kirby uh, that it's not a foregone conclusion and, and the international community should be pressing that through the Security Council and seeing how China and Russia and others uh, respond, um, but it would be good to hear the alternative accountability mechanisms that might be considered. My second very brief question, um, here in the United Kingdom, I, I wondered whether you might comment in so far as you're able to on the United Kingdom's own position. Uh, I've been quite encouraged by my own meetings with the Foreign Office and the UK statement uh, on Monday um, that they, they support the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry. I just wonder whether you've had a, an opportunity to gauge how enthusiastically they'll support it, what sort of leadership role they might or might not take, and what we in this country might or might not need to do to move them into the position that we'd like them to be in. First of all, uh, in relation to uh, the question of alternative remedies, uh, the report of the Commission of Inquiry has quite a detailed um, uh, repertoire of possibilities. We went through the process in reaching the ICC of eliminating a peace and reconciliation process. We didn't think that was suitable or would work. We went through um, a, a, a joint tribunal of North Korea and international judges. We didn't think that would work. We went through a specific ad hoc tribunal, specific to North Korea. We didn't think the international community would accept that. And then in any case, it would probably have to go through the Security Council. And that took us 
to the ICC as an already existing body with a prosecutor and an establishment which would have jurisdiction if the reference were made. And so uh, all of that uh, uh, left, uh, if the ICC uh, is not um, given jurisdiction by the Security Council, and my own view is that that shouldn't be abandoned too easily. Uh, people who are very close to diplomacy sometimes look on these matters as a kind of game of what can be achieved and what can't be achieved. But if you look at it as a lawyer would, the Charter has this structure with the Permanent Five being given, in a way, as guardians for the whole world, the veto power. I happen to think that that was a good thing because without it, the United Nations would probably have gone the way of the League. And therefore, if at first you don't succeed, I can hear, can I hear Baroness Thatcher's uh, words coming back at me, then sometimes you've got to go through the process in order to assert what the Charter gives as the process which is that the international community, with what I would expect would be a very high level of support, repeatedly uh, states what should be done. And if you don't have some remedy on the detailed uh, matters in our report, this time it's difficult to imagine any time when there will be an effective remedy in the face of somebody who thinks in a formalistic way that country-specific mandates are, are not desirable. You've now got a report, whatever your view about country-specific mandates, and there is a, a great moral and uh, legal and political obligation to consider it solemnly and seriously. And I would hope that that is how the Charter is expected to operate and how it should operate. Now, as for the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom uh, from the start has been extremely helpful. Of course, it has the great advantage of having a, an embassy in the DPRK a, and the United Kingdom and Sweden, which also has an embassy in the DPRK, um, has been uh, of help in a proper way to the Commission of Inquiry whilst respecting our independence and respecting their own entitlement to have their own uh, different view if the report wasn't to their liking. As you said, uh, on St Patrick's Day, the representative of the United Kingdom said that the United Kingdom strongly supported the recommendations and it was one of the 37 countries, I think, uh, that supported referral to the um, International Criminal Court. The United Kingdom, like other great powers, the, the Permanent Five, can be a little enigmatic when you come to the, the very essence of what will happen. And I suppose that's an entirely proper thing. They will take their councils and they will decide themselves what they should do. Uh, but I don't doubt that the United Kingdom has a very strong view that the report of the Commission of Inquiry demands some action. There are alternatives that can be uh, dealt with if you don't go, to, don't go or don't eventually get to uh, the ICC. Just the, uh, the regional presence with the continued collection of testimony until a time is reached when the Permanent Five concur that something has to be done. Uh, I haven't seen the news report, but I was telephoned from Australia this morning to be told that there's a news report today that uh, a meeting between China and DPRK, which has been frozen for many months, uh, has been agreed and therefore that there's going to be a meeting between China and DPRK. Uh, that may itself indicate that um, the concern that I would hope and expect that a great country like China feels about having on its border a nation which is so disrespectful of the human rights of its own people. So there are plenty of things that can be done. Towards the end of our report, uh, and in the summary report, there's a whole long list of people-to-people -people things that could be done. And so there's plenty that can be done, 
But we were asked accountability and we answered accountability. And the question is, will the international community, having seen the gross, prolonged, intense and very wrongful acts, consider that accountability should be offered? It can be offered. And therefore, it's a very stark question. It really is a moment of truth for the international community. And that's why I'm hopeful and I also am insistent, respectfully, that it oughtn't to be given away simply because it looks difficult. In life, we all have to do difficult things and sometimes you have to persist. Um, I mentioned in The Hague yesterday that my teacher of international law, Julius Stone, who, by the way, had to leave the United Kingdom because he couldn't get a job because he was Jewish. Um, he came to New Zealand and then to Australia and he taught me international law. And he often would say to us that the Talmud scholars had a very strong statement that it isn't given to any generation to achieve all that is right and to uh, remedy all that is wrong but neither are we free to refrain from the pursuit. And I think this is uh, the message that I, I, I take, that we, we may not achieve it immediately, but we are not free to give up. Well, as I said, uh, I think the judicial process is extremely uh, important and relevant for any country, including North Korea, because it is, in a way, beginning of introduction of rule of law in a country which is all savagely, we have some savage class. However, I think much will depend on what kind of changes we have in North Korea and how much the judicial process will be able to uh, have uh, to uh, affect those who are really truly responsible, as is in, in, indicated in our report. But I think there must be also a parallel process to that because uh, judicial process has a limited uh, impact on society in terms of changing values, uh, criteria, standards, understanding the process itself. So I think there should be also a process of deconceptualization of the educational system to bring uh, these human values closer to the entire nation since they have been uh, so much uh, uh, under repression not only during the 50 years of uh, North Korean rule, but also entire century. I have in mind also the Japan, Japanese colonial uh, rule, which was, also, which was also not very soft to North Korean people and South Korean. So I think uh, we are talking here about a very long process ahead of us. I'm coming from the region which has been affected, and Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey Nice was one of the main uh, figures uh, or characters which I have been very much uh, focusing my attention because I, ho I thought that ISTY would change the context in the society, but uh, I must say it goes very slowly despite all the judgments brought there because uh, the elite was not ready to, to use these judgments as a base for dialogue in the society to see what has happened and how, because the entire society has to be informed about it in terms of learning what has happened and why it has happened. I think this uh, truth-telling thing and uh, explaining why the society in North Korea has come to such a, 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 a point with all these uh, human uh, losses uh, also needs to be explained to generations that are coming. And it is very, very complex. Uh, uh, process which needs uh, all kinds of professions to be engaged, not only on the level of judicial uh, uh, treatment, because, uh, uh, and I would really uh, uh, think that there needs to be a documentation center, maybe already started in South Korea at this moment, based on this uh, 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 commission's report, uh, enable all these people who live in South Korea to be able to testify in all kinds of forms. I think there already exists something like that. But really to make it open and make it much more wider known to uh, South Korean public, but also North Koreans who are coming in the country and continue with this work once hopefully this comes to an end. And uh, uh, I think this work must be started now. And, uh, in terms of uh, seeing how to approach people, maybe South Korea is the best uh, 
the, the best uh, equipped to do that before they are close, you know more about them, <coughs> should be prevented to impose only Western designed, uh, uh, how should I say, um, projects how to deal with the past. I think you have to think uh, it in your own way and give new, how to say, create a model uh, which would reflect the needs of North Korean society but also South Korea because you need uh, to introduce also this uh, aspect of reconciliation of two, na of the two nations in fact, in fact because uh, I can, we can talk now about North Korea as another uh, um, nation considering the cultural changes over the last 50-60 years and uh, this is uh, I think uh, Enormous task ahead of all of you. There's also one other remedy that hasn't been covered in the report, and for very good reason, because the commissioners were instructed to look at accountability. Uh, but that other remedy to have in the back of one's mind is the informal tribunal, which has been useful already where formal judicial process has not been available or is not thought to be available. So that the Russell Tribunal into Vietnam is more or less the only tribunal of record into Vietnam. Um, Gabriel Kirk MacDonald's uh, um, inquiry and 250-page conclusive report into the Japanese comfort women finding uh, the emperor himself guilty on reliable evidence um, is another example of, an, of um, the affected people saying, when let down by the law or by international community, we will establish our own record through a tribunal. And there's been another recent one uh, for the Iran uh, Ayatollah massacres of the 1980s. And I know that this mechanism is being considered in many other areas where people don't expect to be able to seek formal um, process, to be able to obtain formal process. It doesn't, of course, bring accountability, although it may be a step towards accountability. It does serve that very important process already being served by the report of this commission of inquiry and always by trials, the collateral uh, purpose served of leaving a record that those affected can turn to now and their descendants in the future. But it's very much a background, yes. Uh, my name is Nena Trump, and I'm at the university now, but for many years I've worked with the international um, people in Yugoslavia. And one of the experiences from practice and now from academia, what we have when studying post-complex societies is as follows. There is not one preferred option to deal with uh, post-complex societies. Uh, and in the case of North Korea and several other ongoing conflicts, one should make distinction between complex society and post-complex society. Complex society is actually a society where we are talking about uh, um, armed conflict, or in this case, uh, internal political situation that leads to mass atrocities. So if we talk about uh, two general uh, approaches to uh, mass atrocities, ongoing and past mass atrocities, we have retributive justice systems, we have restorative. Those who think that retributive justice system will bring the very important sort of justice are very, very wrong. My experience from practice and now from academia is that anything we have at our disposal should be used in parallel way. We should employ, of course, where we can, and national and international prosecutions, but in the same time, NGOs can do so many things because um, in restorative justice processes, we see that there is a uh, political approach or individual approach, you, you need to deal with the individual witness with traumas, and for that you don't have the time. And turning back to the uh, difference between conflict and post-conflict societies, when we have a conflict society, 
then response to mass atrocities is not the immediate um, demand. The immediate demand is to stop this happening. And while we have complex society, what, who can do that? Well, not NGOs, not diplomats, politicians. There must be a political treaty or whatever, and from then we can talk about post-complex. So we are now in an interesting position that we have still the conflict or whatever we can call it, with no resolution to that which would mean that from this moment on mass atrocities won't happen. So, uh, and putting a lot of emphasis on retributive justice as we call see now, and Sonia and I are involved in actually dealing with trial records for the purpose of truth, they create actually so many more complications to reach the truth, at least historical truth. Legal truth is quite simple. It's a judgment. Whether it's just or not, that's another question. But uh, what is very, very important not to wait for the moment that we can deal with these conflicts in a form of retributive justice, but with each of us, NGOs, politicians, diplomats, religious groups, that they do whatever they can do uh, to actually at least uh, alleviate suffering at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more contributions, and then I want to give Sonia and Michael a chance to sum up. Uh, still with the Christian solidarity worldwide, thank you, commissioners, for a very powerful uh, report. Uh, just uh, two things, very briefly, on the, the issue of religious, the religious persecution in North Korea. We're deeply disappointed too, and we hope that when people log into the website and hear what you said, there will be a take-up about the persecution of those with religious beliefs in North Korea, those in, in the gulags. And uh, I guess one of my knee-jerk knee -jerk reactions at the moment is that probably in the West, it's not so important as it is probably for those in the peninsula. But for us, it's a really important thing and we will do all we can to highlight what's gone on in the prisons. And secondly, why hasn't Pope Francis, for example, who is very engaged in yeah. the world and who is a much more realistic pontiff than we've had for a century or more, why, I wonder why he, he couldn't be invited to make a statement or in his weekly uh, homily to... Why, why couldn't there not be negotiations from your group or the ecumenical uh, dialogue in Christianity to pursue this? I, I, I just my colleague, Ben Rogers, will take that up. I, I, I think, uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, I mean, uh, he's also engaged with the world and we've got to get these religions to be concerned with things that really matter and not with persecuting gays and other things. These are the things that really matter in our they world. Do, and thank you for highlighting. Secondly, surely it's time for the international... Just thought I'd slip that in. Thank you. <laughs> surely it's time for the international community in the UN to, to do something about the position of China and uh, refinement in sending back North Korea to North Korea. I think it's absolutely disgraceful that this is done. They treat them as economic migrants and not refugees. And I think it's time the international community did something. It's outside the scope of your remit, but surely it's time to do something about that. Before summing up, um, and because time is getting short, uh, Brad, I know you want to say something. Has anybody got any proposal for what the ordinary citizen can do that you would want added to the record of this hearing? If it's only a sentence, mention it now. Has anybody got anything they'd like to say? Ben. In a sentence, uh, two things. Write to your member of parliament in this country or if you're in other countries, write to your parliamentary representative. Uh, and secondly, wherever you are in the world, um, I know one of the things that Justice Kirby has endorsed, and I've been involved in campaigning for others too, is for the BBC World Service to establish a Korean language service to, to break the information blockade and shine the light of, of information into North Korea. Uh, so write to the BBC and uh, encourage them to reconsider that. Thank you very much. Brad, I think you had a point. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we've worked really hard uh, to 
Great the commission, helped the commission do its job, it's done a fantastic job. Couldn't, couldn't be more pleased with the work you've done, so thank you very much. Um, the next step is to get the commission's report and its recommendations uh, into operation. I just wanted to let people know that there was a resolution tabled yesterday, which is uh, going to be voted on next week in Geneva, and it recommends the General Assembly to submit the report of the Commission of Inquiry to the Security Council for its consideration and appropriate action in order that those responsible for the human rights violations, including those which may amount to crimes against humanity, are held to account. Um, and, uh, and it also goes on to talk about consideration of the scope for effective targeted sanctions against those who appear to be most responsible for crimes against humanity. Uh, that's paragraph 7. Paragraph 10, it requests the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to urgently follow up on the recommendations in the report of the Commission of Inquiry and provide increased support to the Special Rapporteur, including, and this is crucial, for the establishment of a field-based structure to strengthen monitoring and documentation of the situation of human rights in the DPRK. Um, I mention those things because we are now at the stage where we, uh, we are going to, to see the action move to New York. Uh, the, cri the critical uh, uh, actions there are going to be to get this on the Security Council uh, agenda, to have it be there on a regular, recurring basis, not a one-off, uh, to find the resources to get the commissioners to New York to make the presentation, it's, a, it's, it's an issue, I'm sure we'll resolve it, uh, to uh, make sure that those who would protect this regime are identified, that they're put in the spotlight, they're called out, and I do believe, I agree with you, uh, uh, Michael, that those who would do that will find the spotlight very uncomfortable. And we need to make that as uncomfortable for them as possible. Uh, we expect that to be China, it could be Russia, it could be others. Um, but they will have to answer to the world why they would want to support a regime that continues to treat its own people in the way it does. Uh, and what is really interesting is the point that you made, Michael, which is that this commission inquiry was created without a vote. So that is a glimmer of hope, because at some point, a year ago, the Chinese made a decision not to oppose the creation of the commission, knowing full well that you'd come out with a report similar to this. It was inevitable, because the facts are so clear and so stark. And so, I think we should push very hard. Whether it's an ICC, or whether it's an ad hoc tribunal, whether it's something else, we, we need to push very hard and be very confident and optimistic, um, and, uh, we have to realize, finally, that this is an unusual moment. We talk about conflict situations. I actually, my paradigm is that this is a dictatorship. It's not a conflict. And, and this is actually a challenge for us. Because the conflict puts the news on the front page or in the public domain regularly about what's going on in the country. Without a conflict, we don't have that luxury. Your report is what's making this a live discussion right now. And we need to capitalize on the momentum your report is creating to try to make a difference for people in North Korea. Uh, before you, sir, anybody else from the, penin uh, the peninsula who hasn't contributed, who would like to? Because there's been a lot of... Co Very quickly, please, if you can just make your point yeah, shortly. I'm Kim from LGK and Quab. Uh, my colleague, you mentioned uh, one of the remedies, the targeted sanctions to the most responsible crimes against humanity. What uh, targeted sanction you may uh, include in targeted sanction besides ICC reform? I'll ask Michael to deal with that when he sums up. You had a point, sir. If it's short, please make it. You, very, very short, please. Okay, I had uh, many questions, but then I can always ask uh, Just Michael to read. Just something nice and short. Yes, that's what it was related. But uh, one question is about pay. Was there any interesting ideas which came out from your discussions yesterday? I'll just stop with that. And finally, also congratulations. It's been a great report. And I'm hoping what uh, Brad has said, that this does take up in New York now and that it comes up in the Security Council regularly so that you know it's not forgotten there. That the steps from, has to move from Geneva to uh, New York from now on to make it more effective. Sonia, is there anything you'd like to say to sum up before I... Michael's down to about two minutes now because we've got lunch and uh, timetable and stuff, but Sonia, anything you want to say? No, I think this is a, a momentum to really to take uh, uh, very concerted international action on different levels, uh, national, uh, 
um, uh, international organizations level, but the civil society, media-wise, I think this is a moment we shouldn't be missed as an opportunity to do something for Korea in general. Well, Michael, would you like to deal with the question about sanctions? Um, and anything else you want to say? Yes, I have, I have four little points. Number one is to repeat my thanks to Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, International Commission of Jurists, and all the other uh, international and national human rights bodies. They've played a very admirable role, and they've stuck with it. They haven't had the amnesia that seems to have attacked uh, many other people and groups and politicians in society. And I'd ask them, this is the critical moment. This is the moment of truth. Don't divert your attention now. Uh, and I agree with Brad Adams that um, this is how the Charter is supposed to work. And if, in fact, there is a veto, uh, let it be. Uh, and let those who veto uh, face the international community. It's a different thing now. The blogging, the tweeting in China on this report has been remarkable and it will increase. And uh, I think that ought to be kept in mind. Secondly, uh, you did say, Brad, that the report was inevitable because the uh, outrageous uh, conduct was so clear. That is true, but we live in a real world where sometimes the inevitable doesn't happen because of the fact that people begin to play politics. This commission of inquiry did not play politics. We answered our questions. And really, it's important that the international community uh, should uh, do, do, do the same. The danger, it seems to me, is that the the focus of the Security Council until now has been substantially upon the nuclear issue in the North Korea. And that, in all truth, is an extremely grave situation. That to have a country of such apparent instability in its dealings with its own people in charge of the fourth biggest army of the world and uh, missiles that can deliver the nuclear weapons that it has and is developing is a very dangerous situation. The danger is, uh, for the international community, when it gets again into the bailiwick of the Security Council, the Security Council might say, well, we've got to mainly concentrate on nuclear weapons and uh, international human rights, well, that's important, but we just can't afford, and they might seek to make a deal, the six-party talks, reviving that, and put uh, international universal human rights under the carpet again. I think that is something that must be kept in mind and must be resisted because as the Charter makes it clear, universal human rights and uh, international law relating to um, uh, peace and security are intertwined. Now, the last thing is targeted sanctions. We made it clear in our report that there should not be additional sanctions or burdens that hit the ordinary persons in uh, in North Korea. A very good report came out uh, last month, or may have even been early this month, from the panel that is set up to monitor the United Nations sanctions on North Korea. It's an extremely good and detailed uh, report. It goes down to the presents that were given to Dennis Rodman and his group when they visited North Korea, extremely expensive liqueurs and wines and, may I say, British uh, mulberry bags. Uh, you can see what are taken as the really important gifts to give by the sort of gifts that were given to uh, Rodman and his crew. Uh, so um, that panel or some other body could perhaps be brought into a discussion and maybe will be about areas where sanctions could bite. A and I think that uh, it's important to keep in mind we said don't add to the burdens of of ordinary citizens, but there will be spaces, as is shown in the report of the panel. Pope Francis is an idea to be conjured with. I myself am not a Roman Catholic, and I've had one or two little disputes with the Roman Catholic Church in recent years, but uh, and other Christian churches and other religions. But um, he is a good communicator, and he is in touch with the world of today. I think. Um, 
if the Reverend Windsor can overcome his Protestant disinclination to engage with Rome, uh, then it might be that the Pope will reflect upon the great moral issue of a country which is um, the government of the country but is not really respecting the human rights of its people and I, I think that would be a message that would go out to a very influential audience around the world and we should do what can be done to encourage it because it is a great moral challenge to the international community and the Holy Father maybe has something to say about it. We are fortunate to have a few refreshments in the adjoining room provided by EK and such little things that enable people to stay together, to talk about events, are in fact part of the process of human persuasion and we shouldn't overlook them. We should be grateful for the evidenced human persuasion, much of it present in this room, that has led to the Commission of Inquiry and to this excellent report. We can now afford a limited measure of optimism that the future is not as bleak as it seemed as little as two years ago when we were considering, many of us, what external intervention, if any, might be brought to bear. We have that limited optimism, not just because of the work of the many people in this room and those whom they represent, but because of the report and of the independence and the excellence of the two commissioners, whom I'm sure you would now like to thank in the usual way before adjourning next time.